All right, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9. And as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in a tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Again, if you're marking the word follow, then you've got two more occurrences of the word here in verse 9. But as we're seeing the number of disciples uh, grow with the, the 12 inner circle of Jesus' followers, and now we add Matthew to um, this particular list. Matthew, though, is uh, different than the others because he is one that is a tax collector, a publican who collected taxes for the Romans. He was not a popular guy because they hated the Romans and they despised the taxes that they had to pay to Rome. And now you've got a Jew working for the enemy. And so, when you talk about publicans and sinners, uh, you're talking about those that were considered on the lowest rung of Jewish society, that they could actually betray their own people by uh, working for the Romans. And publicans were generally not considered to be very honest. The way they made their money was to uh, up the fees that you owed. And then they would pocket those fees. And, and as it happened, as he was reclining at table in the house, the house of Matthew, behold, many tax gatherers and sinners came and joined Jesus and, and his disciples at the table. All right, so Jesus is part of his ministry. He had um, no problem with dealing with the lost, dealing with those that had some uh, spiritual uh, problems. Now, who the sinners are is uh, open to some discussion, but uh, most scholars believe that these are the unsynagogued, those who are not engaged in Jewish life, Jewish worship uh, at any level, almost like today we would call someone uh, an unchurched individual. Verse 11, And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax gatherers and sinners? Now this gives us a glimpse into the heart of of the rabbis and how they conducted themselves they withdrew from those ilk of society they were not evangelistic they were not going to rub shoulders with people like this and they were offended that Jesus would uh, have any contact with this kind of people but Jesus is not acting like a typical rabbi. And they want to know why. So, Jesus then gives a point that uh, he's going to come back around to in chapter 11, verses 16 through 19. Now, again, if you're circling the passages that have questions... Circle verse 11. Why does your teacher eat with the tax gatherers and sinners? Now this is one of those questions that actually is going to get somewhat of an answer. But when he heard this, he said, It is not for those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are ill. <laughs> Now, what have I called chapters 8 and 9? The miracle, miracle chapters. The miracle chapters. What are we talking about in verse 12? A healer. A healer. 
a physician. So again, even this particular event is placed here with some forethought uh, on the part of Matthew and, of course, through the direction of the Holy Spirit and inspiration. It belongs here. Why? Because we're talking about the great physician. Now, the point that Jesus makes is that it is not those who are healthy that need a physician. You don't go see a doctor. Okay, well, uh, why don't you come see me today? Just feeling great, doc. Thought I'd pop in and say, hey. <laughs> you don't do that. You go see him when you're sick because you need help. You need comfort. You need medicine. Well, who in this context are the sick? The tax collectors and the tax gather the tax collectors and the sinners. Now, some of you were a little slow in answering that, and that worries me a little bit because it tells me that you're you're not yet attuned to thinking textually. But you got to think textually. What are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus going into the house of tax gatherers and sinners. And then the next thing we know, he's saying, "Why did you? Why are you here?" And then he makes this comment about the healthy don't need me, the sick do. Well, that's why I'm here in the house of tax gatherers and sinners. How is it? And maybe you can. <coughs> as far as the home construction. How is it that he can be sitting here talking, leaning down, talk, talking with these guys at a table, somebody else is outside and he's addressing them? I mean, that's the scene I see in my mind. Yeah, probably not that much of a distance. Uh, and, you know, Jesus was constantly aware of what was being said, even if it was uh, a whisper, like even in... Um, the previous miracle, verse 4, and Jesus knowing their thoughts. Uh, so, uh, I'm not sure of the dynamic, but somehow or another... Um, Open window or something. Yeah, it's possible. Or it's possible that he walked out and, and they thought he didn't hear him. He says, I, I know what you said. But go, he tells them, and learn what this means. Now, if I tell you that you need to learn something, what does that suggest? Listen. It's important. You don't know it. You don't know it. These are the Pharisees. These are the big guns, top guys, the big dogs, the numero unos. And Jesus is slapping them down and said, you need to go learn something. You need to go learn what this means. And he quotes from Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. Now, the, the Pharisees and the rabbis were all about sacrifice. They were talking about the mint, the dill, the cumin, the, the, the little bitty precise aspects of obedience. They were not going to miss a sacrifice. They were not going uh, to violate any of these uh, minutia of God's laws. But they were just not nice people. They were not people that really cared about you and your life and your problems and your issues and your sins. Go and learn what that verse meant, Hosea 6.6. 6. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. Now, what he means by sacrifice is ritual correctness. Obviously, God uh, commanded sacrifice. But if you look at the context in Hosea chapter 6, you'll see that the problem was that they were going through the motions, but outside of going through the motions, they were just not spiritual people. And the Pharisees 
are exactly the same. And then he says, For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now I suspect that what Jesus means here is <coughs> what Paul is saying in Romans 3 and verse 9, that there is none righteous. No, not one. <laughs> so if there's none righteous, then what does Jesus mean when he says, I come to call the righteous? Is he being almost sarcastic? He's being sarcastic, which means what? He's, he's saying, I, I don't, I'm not coming to talk to you guys because you guys are too good. You guys, right. You, you guys are, are self-righteous. Yeah. And that's exactly right. I'm not coming to deal with you guys. You guys that are holier than thou, think all is good, think you don't have any problems. Uh, I'm, I'm not here for you guys. But I'm here for the sinners. <clears throat> the Jews were not aware of their lostness, the Pharisees especially. Thus, they don't think they need an Jesus, a Jesus, a Savior. The sinner knows he needs help. Man, I messed up. I got problems. I've got issues. I need help. Verse 14, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? I don't think here we should see any level of animosity whatsoever. It's just an innocent question, and they don't get why John and they are fasting, whereas Jesus, who John is constantly pointing to, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, John 129. Why he's pointing to Jesus, and Jesus isn't acting like John has, and the John's disciples act. So, we're a little confused. Why is that? So John had some people that were following him, and Jesus had people following him, and these they were kind of like comparing themselves? Right. <laughs> right. That's interesting. All right, Jesus gives them two responses. The first response is an illustration about a bride, groom, and the attendants. The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them. Can they? But the Days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Alright, so with this first illustration, Jesus is the bridegroom. And while I'm here, my disciples are going to do what I want to do. I'm the bridegroom. And when you get married, you're the man, you call the shots, all the attention's on you, you do what you want to do. All right, that's Jesus. And he knows that his mission is to work with sinners. And if you're really going to impact sinners, you need to go where they are, do what they do, uh, and hobnob with them, eat with them, fellowship with them. And so that's Jesus' mission. That's why he's doing what he's doing. But when Jesus is taken away, then it's time to fast. And so we don't have any recorded uh, accounts of the disciples fasting after the ascension, but uh, assuming that's what they did. <clears throat> Second response actually has two parts to it, but with the same application. The first part has to do with a patch of untrunk cloth. And then the second part, verse 17, has to do with wineskins. All right, so let's look at the first illustration. <clears throat> no one puts a patch of untrunk cloth on an old garment. 
for that patch pulls away from the garment and a worse tear results. All right, so his point here is don't try to mix the old with the new. What I am doing is completely new. Jesus is that new patch. But they're trying to fit him into an, a, an old mold that is what they think that the Messiah should be doing, how they think the Messiah should be acting. Don't do that, because that's as illogical as putting a new uh, patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Uh, it's just not going not gonna to work. You said unshrunk? Unshrunk. Unshrunk. Mm-hmm. And then, second, he talks about wineskins, verse 17. And do men put new wine into old wineskins? Well, men don't do that. Otherwise, the wineskins burst, and the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. You see, wine that's in the fermentation process expands. And so it's got to be in a container that can expand with it. But once a wineskin has already expanded, it can't expand anymore. It's maxed out. And so if you fill it up with wine that's going to ferment and expand, the wineskin's going to burst and all of the the, the wine that was poured in that wineskin is going to be lost. And the wineskin is worthless. So, you got new wine, you put that in a new wineskin. His point, if you try to fit the new into the old, you're going to end up losing both. Now, unfortunately, we have had some today who have taken this section and have understood it to be saying that the gospel needs to be an ever-changing dynamic, dependent upon the society in which you live. So, you don't want to take the old... 2,000 year old gospel and put the 21st century mentality in to that old mold. It won't work. And so you're going to end up destroying everything. But they say that what Jesus means here is that you come up with a new wineskin with every generation. And what is it that's going to uh, impact this society. And by way of application, they'll say, our society is not going to tolerate a church that won't let women preach. Our society is not going to tolerate a church that is legalistic. Our, our society is not going to tolerate a church that doesn't have a band in worship. And by our being hard-nosed and stubborn and insisting that that's the way it's going to be, though. No women preachers and no instruments in worship. And and then you're trying to put the 21st century into that old wineskin, and it's not going to work. So Jesus is giving us permission to take the gospel and modernize it. The problem with that is that God no longer reigns supreme. Man becomes God because man calls the shot. And now man is the one that determines what it is that God likes and doesn't want. Because now man is saying, this is the way we're going to worship. And this is, it's, it's going on the whims of men rather than the inspired, eternal revelation from God. 
What Jesus, okay, that's what Jesus is not teaching here. Although that's what some have done with this. What, as a matter of fact, you may even be familiar with the magazine called Wineskins. <clears throat> well, that's what that's all about. And they're promoting uh, this modern agenda in that magazine. What Jesus means, though, is you're not going to be able to try to fit what I'm doing in with the old law. A perfect illustration of what Jesus is talking about is seen in Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 and following. Now, the, the churches in Galatia were battling with some men that we call Judaizers. What was it that the Judaizers were trying to merge? More specifically, circumcision and Christianity. What does Paul say about that? You have fallen from Christ, you are severed. You have fallen from grace, you are severed from Christ. Can't do it. So, Jesus is bringing in a whole new system. A whole new system. And the, the disciples of John need to understand that truth. And Jesus isn't pounding on us, but he needs them to understand, just like in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said, but I said. We're going a different direction now, folks. I'm taking you a whole new, uh, new way. Okay. Questions, comments about that? What was the Galatians? Five, one, and follow. Okay. The Jones disciples would have left the understanding then that what Jesus is doing is not, uh, you can't try to look at it through the eyes of the old law. Exactly. Yeah. Don't try to put the square peg in a round hole. It's, it's, it's not going to work. Verse 18. While he was saying these things to them, behold, there came a synagogue official. Now, if you're doing what you did in chapter 8 and you're marking the miracles and numbering them, uh, this would be number 2, synagogue official. A synagogue official was a man that was considered to be the most powerful, influential figure in a particular community. The synagogue was the central place of worship. And so every Saturday when they would come for synagogue worship, he was large and in charge. And he called the, called the shots. And so a very well-respected, powerful man is now coming to Jesus. And what does he do? What does your Bible say he does? He bowed before him. Now, seriously? Arguably the most powerful man in this city comes up to Jesus and is bowing down before him. Wow. Saying, my daughter has just died. But come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Now, He's demonstrating some tremendous faith. We do not have at this point in time any recorded uh, resurrections by the hand of Jesus. Now, it's possible that because we're not really being chronological that the guy had heard that Jesus had raised the dead of some others and, and so... Uh, now believe Jesus can do this. Or it's possible that he's the first. The first one to ever reason if this guy can do this, 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 and this, then why can't he do that? Now, he does show a little bit of a lack of faith in that, unlike the centurion in chapter 8, he wants Jesus to come and lay his hand on her.
Now, the translation says he bowed down, but the Greek says he worshipped. Hmm. Worshipped. So there's a different word for like bow versus worship? No, there's not. It was a translator's choice, and I don't think it's a particularly good one. Uh, worship is what what he's doing. All right, Jesus rose and began to follow him, so he's uh, willing to do that. But we have an interruption. And so um, in verse 20, you have number three, a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years. She's miracle number three. Came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. Now, Jesus apparently was wearing clothing that would have identified him as a rabbi that had um, tassels that hung from the edge of the rope and would basically just kind of uh, scrape the floor. So as Jesus is walking by, there basically would be something that would kind of hang behind him, kind of flow behind him. And what she's saying to herself, verse 21, if I only touch his garment, I shall get well. I don't need anything more than that. Now, literally the Greek says, if I touch his garment, I shall be saved. Now, yes, she's talking about being saved from this ailment, but I wish that our translations would help us out by staying with what the, the text is saying. Matthew is hammering this word saved. Remember what they said to Jesus uh, while they were in the boat. Save us. We're perishing. Jesus is Savior. And he's proving that he can save in multiple ways. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, Daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. And at once, the woman was made well. Twelve long, miserable, horrible, painful years healed in an instant. Just like that. Why does he call her daughter? Um... Because she's a daughter of Jerusalem. If you look in the, the book of Jeremiah, you'll see that that's a recurring phrase uh, for the women of Israel. <clears throat> All right. Now, the little uh, side story with the, um, the woman is over. We move on now to the synagogue officials whose daughter has died. And when Jesus came into the official's house, he saw the flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder. What are they doing? Professional mourners. Professional mourners. They're crying. They're wailing. They're screaming. They're rending their garment. They're laying themselves on the floor. They're, it's, it's a mad scene of commotion. Remember, this was arguably the most powerful man in the city. He probably had... Uh, big bucks, and so he could have hired the full lot of professionals. That's awesome. Why would he? What's the point of hiring people to cry for? Him? Just to emphasize the magnitude of the loss, I think. He began to say, Depart, for the girl is not dead, but asleep. And they were laughing. At him. Well, 
Because they're not really mourning. They're professionals. They can flip that switch in a, in a hurry and turn their mourning to laughter. But when the crowd had been put out, he entered. See, this is not a show. This, this is not your uh, everybody gather around and, and look at me do something event. He has no interest whatsoever in dealing with the people that are laughing at him, thinking, what kind of a joke is this guy? He doesn't even know a dead body when he sees one. He entered, took her by the hand, and the girl arose. Now, I would love to have been there when all of these people that were put out of the house... They're standing there, and they're still laughing, and they're saying, you know, what kind of a fool uh, man is this? And he walks out holding a little girl by, her, by the hand. Man, how cool that was. I think their laughter would have turned her to... Tears, maybe. <laughs> Real tears. That's right, beer. Yeah, beer. This guy didn't raise her. He can kill us. <laughs> and this news went out to all the land. Why wouldn't it? I mean, you've got all these people. you got the synagogue official. You've got a girl being raised from the dead. Man, can't wait to tell everybody. Verse 27, as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him. All right, you got two things to mark here. You got blind men, they're number four. And then you got the word followed. Saying, Have mercy on us, son of David. Now, this illustrates what I was talking about when I was uh, trying to help you see the, the meaning of the word Elios, the word mercy. That it is not a word that means forgiveness exclusively. They want him to have mercy on them, but what are they wanting him to do? Give them their sight back. That would be an act of mercy. And after he had come to the house, the blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Circle the question. Do you believe that I am able to do this? Now, again, this is a, a great text to explore. If the answer is yes, and it most certainly is, why is it yes? Now, the answer has to be that they may have been blind physically, but they are most certainly not blind, what? <laughs> Spiritually. <clears throat> so here you have all of these guys that see everything. They're watching Jesus raise a girl from the dead. They're watching Jesus heal a woman that's got uh, 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 bleeding problems for 12 years. They're seeing a paralyzed man be healed by Jesus, and they just don't see anything. Now he's doing it by Satan. And then you got blind men that see perfectly, that see clearly what's going on. So he said, do you believe that I am able to do this? Guess what, what the word able? Authority. Authority. Power. I've got the power, the ability. It's not the same Greek word, though, but it's the same concept of, of ability and power. They said, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, be it done to you according to your faith. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, saying, see here, let no one know about this. This is the Messianic secret, which we'll talk about when we get to chapter 11. But they went out and spread the news about him in all that land. They just couldn't help themselves, even though Jesus asked them not to 
do that. All right, verse 32. And as they were going out, behold, a dumb man, demon-possessed, was brought to him. Circle that. That's number five. After the demon and the demon possessed was brought to him, and after the demon was cast out, the dumb man spoke, and the multitudes marveled, saying, Nothing like this was ever seen in Israel. Now, they had their share of seeing some uh, amazing stuff, maybe some stuff that uh, might have been hard to explain, but Jesus has blown them away with miracle after miracle. A guy that couldn't speak suddenly can speak. Would, would this be something, <clears throat> is the guy just, uh, like what exactly is a mute person? Because I don't think I've ever seen that. Somebody Probably just, not. They're they're very rare. But somebody that just uh, does not cannot get the muscles and everything to function so he can talk. Okay, so it's a physical thing. It wasn't like a okay. no. It wasn't like he didn't learn or yeah. Okay. It wasn't actually dumb. He just although that's usually uh, the label. You talk about a man that's deaf and dumb, oh. can't hear, can't speak. But the Pharisees were saying, he cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. So the multitudes are saying, this is so unbelievably cool, we've never seen anything like this ever. And the Pharisees are going, we got to do something. Now, You've watched enough movies and so on. When a soldier puts his helmet on the, the end of his rifle and he sticks it up above the wall, why does he do that? Yeah. He wants to see who's going to fire at it. Anybody out there? Well, this particular argument by the Pharisees is putting their helmet on the, the butt of the rifle, and let's just kind of float this argument and see if it gets any traction. What kind of response are we going to get? And apparently, the response was favorable enough that by the time we get to chapter 12, it's a full-blown theology on the part of the Pharisees, where they are now publicly telling, teaching others yeah, he's doing it, but he's doing it by the power of Satan. <laughs> so right now, it's kind of a, let's just float that out there and see uh, what happens. Because nothing else is said about it here. And Jesus was going about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of about the coming kingdom of God and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. All right? Another miracle section of the nine that we have in the book where Matthew once again just gives us a snapshot Every disease, every sickness, every anything, Jesus uh, takes care of that. And seeing the multitude, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. Now we'll learn some more about this when we get to chapter 11, verses 28 and following, but here's the problem. The standard of righteousness that was established by the scribes and Pharisees was so oppressive, so demanding, it was impossible 
for anybody to live up to that standard. And people want to be right with God. People want to be spiritual. People want to feel like they're saved. <clears throat> and the scribes and Pharisees so beat them down with the fact that they were in violation of their traditions that they were distressed. Your footnote will tell you that the word actually could mean harassed. That would be by the religious elite, by the scribes, by the Pharisees, by the Sadducees. And they were downcast. They were put down, thrown down, humiliated, ridiculed, because they messed up. And stood in violation of these ridiculous, impossible laws that were established by the scribes and Pharisees. And he says that they were like sheep without a shepherd. No direction, no guidance, no real spiritual mentoring going on. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Now remember, he saw the multitudes. We've got lots of people that need help, but we've got few people that are reaching out to help them. So, <clears throat> the harvest, there's plenty to do. There's just not enough people to do it. Therefore, beseech the Lord of harvest to send forth workers into his harvest. Pray to God that we have more workers. Now, that's something that you don't have to remind any of us here at Bear Valley to pray. You are the answer to my prayer. And that scares me a little bit, but <laughs> you're, you're the answer. What you pray for. It, yeah, yeah. yeah, be careful. It wasn't the answer you were expecting, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, but we need you. The Lord needs workers, and we should pray um, for more workers. Because there's still a lot of work to be done. And there are people out there that are asking, seeking, and knocking. And uh, it's our job, your job, my job to be the answer to their, their prayers. Okay, I'm going to back up because for some reason these slides were out of order. What we have, beginning with verse 36, is the beginning of speech section numero dos. That's number two. It's the beginning of So beginning here and going all the way through the end of the speech section um, is virtually broken down into these, <clears throat> these three parts. 
All right. Um. <clears throat> Chapter 10, verse 1, is what is referred to as the limited commission. And having summoned his twelve disciples, he gave to them authority. Now, if you've been marking that word as we've seen it occur in the text, then here's yet one more. Now, the fact of the matter is, you can't give what you don't have. You can't give authority if you don't have authority. And authority has been a key concept in Matthew. And for those of you that uh, have been trying to stay up with this, um, that's just a summary of some of the verses, not all of the verses, uh, that we have seen and that we will see. He taught with authority, he forgave showing authority. Now he's transferring authority, and he's going to claim, once it's all over, to have all authority. Well, he proved that in the book. fact of the matter is, the Messiah was expected to be one that had authority. And so, Matthew is doing his job, and he's doing it very, very well. Proving Jesus to be the Messiah in the area of authority. disciples power over three areas. First, unclean spirits, to cast out unclean spirits. Well, who exactly is this? It's any person possessed by an evil spirit was considered unclean and therefore excluded from the social and religious life of the Jews. Now, some have tried to suggest that demon possession and unclean spirit possession uh, were not the same thing. But I would uh, appeal to you to consider, once again, uh, Matthew 8 and verse 16. They brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with the word. So... An unclean spirit is demon possession. It's the same thing. Um, There's not a difference. But what they're saying is that an unclean spirit was a wicked person in a previous life that now inhabits the body of a living person. And that a demon can come from Satan and is a part of the, the demonic, angelic realm. But... Such an argument is not sustainable, and Matthew 8 uh, and verse 16 would be one of those verses uh, to show that there's nothing in the Bible that would indicate that uh, people that died have any other contact or association with um, the living. 
All right, so we're talking about casting out demons, casting out unclean spirits, same thing. Then he gave them power over every kind of disease. When we talk about disease, we're talking about cancer, leukemia, MS, something like that. So if they're encountering anybody that's got those problems, the disciples could cure them. And then every kind of sickness, flu, colds, headaches, those are sicknesses. All right, verse 2. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. Now, remember that they were just called, in the previous verse, 12 disciples. And now they're being called 12, 12 apostles. Uh, the gospel writers frequently mingle that terminology. Uh, so, you're neither right nor wrong to call them 12 disciples or the 12 <coughs> apostles. It's not the work of the redactor. Yeah. <laughs> See, you're already studying uh, documentary hypothesis in, in the redactors. The first, Simon, who is called Peter. In every list of the 12, Peter is always first. That's cool. He's always named first. Now, that's significant because if you know anything about the way that they did lists uh, in ancient times, uh, the first name was always priority, uh, was always the one that was uh, the leader of that particular uh, group. And so Peter, uh, out of the 12, was considered to be uh, leader of the 12. And to his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax gatherer, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. All right, the Simon, the Cananean, is really Simon the Zealot. A zealot was one who was a part of a larger group that was working to overthrow the Romans. Mm -hmm. And they were uh, the ones that would have the Sicarii, the knives that they would stab the soldiers with. Uh, and they were actually the ones that brought about the destruction of Jerusalem. And so you've got Matthew <coughs> who works for the Romans and then you've got Simon who wants to kill them all. You want to talk about Jesus bringing, bad, bringing together uh, a very diverse group. You've got exactly that. You've got everything from um, educated to the uneducated. Verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, I was just wondering, you were saying how... Uh you said Peter was usually always the first due to priority back then. Is that also why Judas would be the last? Or would they have not? No, that's correct. That's correct? No. Right. Now, if you look at verse 38 of the last chapter, <laughs> we're beseeching the Lord of Harvest to do what? Send out workers. 
Then you drop down to chapter 10 and verse 5. Guess what Jesus is doing? He's sending out workers. Now, although this is a different Greek word than what is found in 938, the concept is undeniably connected. We're praying for God to send out workers, and that's exactly what Jesus is doing. Now, he instructs them with 16 imperatives. So, in a, he's got 16 commands that he's going to give them. First, do not go, that's the command, to the Gentiles. Now, as we're going to see, is the ministry of Jesus was to Israel. That's why Paul could say in passages like Romans 1 and verse 16 that I'm not ashamed of the gospel versus the power of God for salvation uh, to everyone who believes. What? Anybody finish that? The Jew first and also to the Greek. The Jew first, then also to the Greek. When you look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, and Jesus is telling them that the spread of the gospel is to go uh, starting where, and then how does it go out from there? Jerusalem, Judea, Judea, Judea Samaria, Samaria, and the rest of the world. The rest of the world. So, this is what's being practiced here. We're going to start just with the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles. And he says, secondly, do not enter into any city of the Samaritans. They also, although they're what we would call half-breeds, they're a, a mixture of Jews and Gentiles, it is, don't be thinking, well, they're kind of Jews. Uh, we'll go to them. No, don't want you going there either. Kind of funny that you had to tell them this because they wouldn't have wanted to go to them anyway, would they? No, probably not. It's interesting that he said that when in his he's, he's healed some non-Jews to, up to this point, right? Uh, well, no, he's uh, you know he'll he'll the the centurion servant. Yeah. But that wasn't a non Jew. Uh, about the Syrophoenician? The centurion was not. Syrophoenician woman is still to come. Oh, the servant is not. And then um, the, the woman at the well in John 4, we're not quite sure where the, chronologically that fits here. Um, probably after this. All right. Go to, and notice what he calls them the lost sheep. Of the house of Israel. Unfortunately, the the bulk of God's people are lost, and so I want you to go to them. In Matthew 15 and verse 24, Jesus is going to say, "I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel." Chapter 15, verse 24. As you go, preach. This is what you're going to do. You're not just going to cast out demons and Heal people. You're going to preach. And we'll find out what they're going to preach next time. Yes.